I want to start off by introducing Molly. So Molly is the library, Molly Westmoreland, Westmoreland is the library director for Wilson County Public Library. She was previously the public library consultant for the State Library of North Carolina, um, the director of Appalachian Regional Library. And then she also began her career um, in libraries out in California, where she was the branch manager and senior librarian at the San Jose Public Library. I know that in our consortia partnerships, we might have some folks joining us from California. So I wanted to start off with that. Um, this session is working towards bias-free hiring practices, tools to create diversity and excellence in your workforce. And with that, I will hand it over to Molly. And thank you, Devin, so much. And I, I do want to make one correction, and I probably misled you, but San Jose was um, pretty much middle career for me. I started oh, okay. my career in the East, actually in children's services. So my, okay. my heart is still there in many ways. So, but thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you all for joining this webinar and then giving me an opportunity to share our library's experiences in working toward excellence and diversity in our library workforce. In the process, we came up from about 4% African-American staff in 2018 and uh, come all the way to at least 23% of our staff as African-American or Hispanic as of October of this year. So we are happy with the results in both ways, both in terms of excellence and also diversity, but we're not done yet. It's a work in progress. So I'm getting a little trouble with my, there. So we'll start with organizational culture. And exactly what is an organizational culture? I found a great definition that says, it's basically the way people behave within an organization based on shared principles that are established by leadership and then communicated and reinforced through various methods, ultimately shaping employee perceptions, behaviors, and understanding and the steps towards building a culture are what we're gonna talk about next. It starts with management. So we created a management team, a high functioning management team, limited to managers, staff who had direct reports. So they actually manage staff in our different departments, which as you can imagine in a public library, our um, circulation and children or youth services, adult services and so on. So it, in the past, it had been a more loosely organized group, but we limited, we honed down to just the people who influence staff members through management. We meet regularly every month and we meet on the Thursday after our county's leadership team meetings on Wednesday. And that gives me an opportunity to report out on what I've learned from other county department heads. We rotate responsibility for meetings. So it doesn't always land on one person, namely me, but um, anyone else either. So to organize and create an agenda and also someone to take notes at each meeting and that rotates among all of us. We work toward a me meetings uh, that are based on consensus and collaboration rather than a hierarchy of you, here's what I want you to do, now go and do it. It's more like, I like to think of it as King Arthur's round table. Nobody's been knighted yet, but we have that atmosphere of everyone's ideas and opinions are equally valuable. And this was really highlighted as we were heading into COVID-19 and the decision had to be made whether or not to close our library. I was devastated by the thought. My management team recognized the importance of that. I worked in a library where doors closed, people were outside wondering what happened. It's a terrible, uh, it's a terrible feeling 
to shut people out. So I was very reluctant. They all voted yes, we're going to close on this date. And I voted no. And they said very kindly, well, Molly, we'll do whatever you want. And I said, oh, no, no, that's not how this works. And of course, they were absolutely right. And so that round table feeling that it's not me, it's all of us together. It's, a, it's really beneficial to the spirit and the productivity of, the, of our meetings. We always define a purpose for our meetings. And in agenda items, we label them. This item is for a decision. This item is planning. This is reporting. This item is training. We never just say this item is for discussion. We can talk anytime we want. And there's plenty of discussion that goes along with this process, but we don't meet just to discuss. So training is part of our management team meeting structure, including a wonderful book that we read. Each of us had a copy. We read and discussed this book called No Ego. This was in 2019 by Cy Wakeman. And now we're ready for poll question one. We want to know what is your organizational culture like? So we have 28 out of 38, oh, 29 who have participated. Just want to take a couple more seconds until I share the poll. All right. Everyone can see that, right? So I'm so happy to see such a high percentage uh, of high commitment and self-motivation and the strong personal accountability. I see a high, the highest percentage is complaints, criticism, and negativity. Believe me, my heart goes out to you. I have been there. And this organization that I'm in now was also there. And so I understand what that's like and how common that is. So don't feel alone by any chance if you answered that one. And that sense of entitlement as well is pretty pervasive. So what this book did for us, it's a great read. It's a short read and it's funny and clear and just excellent. It helped us see what we had. It helped us look at our organization and see exactly what you all have reported on, some of you, the 55%, in that we had drama, we had uh, negativity and complaining and, uh, and all of that. So now we could see it, we began to work to reduce it with Cy Wakeman's help. And it helped us to see exactly what kind of organizational culture we wanted, which was those first two categories, a high level of accountability and commitment. We, we could understand that very clearly after having our reading and discussion during management team meetings. And we did it over several meetings. And we were now clear about the importance of commitment and resilience, ownership, and so on. These are the qualities we want in our staff. We began to evaluate staff based on what we wanted to see from them and use that no ego lens. We have a system for evaluation that includes uh, basic management areas like technology or personnel or collection management, program management, and so on. But in that, those li list of categories, we include 
display desired principles and behavior because we developed a guideline for uh, um, and st for standards for employee behavior. And we go over these with our staff every year during their appraisal process. We appraise them based on this, but then we review and we actually have them sign our guidelines to make sure it's very clear. These are our organizational requirements, not just county personnel requirements and library policy, but also requirements around behavior. And they include accountability, uh, innovation and creation. Uh, diversity and inclusion, teamwork and collaboration, and more. And within those descriptions, you, you will find words like courtesy and respect and so on. This was the way we worked towards our zero drama workplace. Towards, that's the key word. Towards, not absolutely there yet, but we're working. So what do you think happened when we began to implement a no ego workplace? Well, I think you can imagine some people left. They didn't like the new system. They enjoyed drama. Many people, I'm, I'm sorry to say, many people thrive on drama. I'm sure you've seen this. If they don't find it in their workplace, they may create it. So we had some people leave. They no longer fit in to the culture and they found work elsewhere. And we sent them off with our blessing and hoping that they would always succeed and do well in life. No hard feelings. But we also saw that the best people stayed and they also promoted through the ranks because they had these qualities we were looking for. Naturally, we began to offer them opportunities for more responsibility. But of course, both of these things end up with vacancies. So now what do we do? We have vacancies. How do we make sure that as we hire, we support our desired organizational um, culture? So we knew we wanted this. We knew we wanted candidates with accountability, as many of you saw in, your, in the poll. You see that in your workforce, and that's what you want. People who take ownership and who can say, oh, I messed that up, or I made a mistake, and it was my fault. It's not a process of beating yourself up, but simply taking ownership. That's what we wanted. We also wanted them to have perseverance in the face of obstacles, to have that I can succeed at this attitude. And we wanted people to learn from their results, to be open to the process, not just that final result and then, okay, I'm on to the next thing, but to debrief and to process what they learned uh, as they went along. But how to find them? We uh, No Ego is a great book, but it doesn't talk about the hiring process. Fortunately, we found this book and it is a very, very helpful book. I highly recommend it by Carol Quinn. Motivation-Based Interviewing, or MBI, as we call it. What we learned from this was that it, there is a way to, a technique for hiring that will clarify who we're looking for and why. And we changed our model from behavioral to motivation-based interviewing. And, uh, the, and we'll go into a little more uh, the details about why it was her method and we saw the value of it, but also we learned a little bit about behavioral uh, interviewing. What we're finding is that as we interview, we are continuing to improve our organization culture. So uh, less drama, more teamwork and greater accountability and better customer service. The, the nice, there are many nice things about human beings, but one of them is we are gregarious, which means we enjoy being in a herd. We enjoy being around people who are somewhat like us in many ways, not, not exactly, but who share some of our character traits or qualities, uh, our viewpoint of life, maybe optimism, whatever. 
And if you're working in that group, you, you, you feel pretty happy. If the people around you share your approach to um, teamwork and uh, the minimization of drama and the excellence in customer service, that's going to make a happier work environment. Uh, some of Carol Quinn's principles uh, were absorbed in the process by us. And one of them is the law of achievement. I love this one. First of all, there are going to be obstacles. We know that. We've come up against them, I'm sure, many times. Life is not easy and it's often hard. So accept the fact that there are going to be obstacles. But only the ones who find a way to overcome them are going to reach their goal. So that's the key, is overcoming obstacles and recognizing that there is always a solution. And in the book, she talks about there's a cure for the common cold. There is one. We just haven't found it yet. So I love that philosophy of the solution is out there. We just haven't found it yet. It keeps you positive. And optimism is key. If you are an optimist, you have a better chance of finding the solution. Now, this kind of optimism is not Pollyanna, rose-colored glasses. Oh, everything will work out no matter what. This form of optimism it involves hard work, but un with the understanding that hard work and searching determinedly committed in a committed fashion towards a solution will eventually yield a result. I read a study about the brain. You know, they're finding so much about the brain by using uh, MRI and other techniques to look at blood flow in the brain. And they found that optimism or optimism tends to increase the blood flow to the part of the brain that works on problem solving. And pessimism actually shuts down that portion of the blood flow to that brain, to that portion of your brain. So it's, it's biologically in our best interest to cultivate in ourselves an optimistic viewpoint around failure and mistakes and obstacles and so on, and knowing that we can find the solution. Failure is, is a, a, a huge part of what we are looking for, the attitude toward failure and the recognition of how important failure is in your work and recognizing and accepting the value of it because it happens many times. In San Jose, we read a book called The Medici Effect and one of the ideas was the, the greats in history, the Michelangelo's, the Leonardo da Vinci's, they were lucky in that, that at that point in Italy, they had tremendous financial support so they could devote themselves to their art, but they made many mistakes. They did, there was plenty of, of art that they discarded and, and in working toward their best result. And it's the quantity that you produce that's important, not waiting until your inspiration makes you create a masterpiece. So failure is the building block towards success. It gives us learning opportunities, basically what works and what doesn't. It's so important. I remember when I first started here, a staff member, didn't, they didn't know me well. They didn't know what to expect, of course. Uh, one of my, actually a manager came to me and she said, oh, Molly, I made a mistake. And my response was, yay. And she was taken aback by that. And so she, I said, what, did, what happened? And she told me, and I shook my head and I said, that's a disappointingly small mistake. I'd like you to do better in the future. So, the attitude toward failure, the acceptance of failure starts at the top. And it's important to cultivate that sense in your staff that it's okay. You put yourself out there, you work hard occasionally, and maybe often you're going to fail. This ties in with the idea of locus of control. And I hope you all had an opportunity to 
do the pre-work and look a little bit at that and maybe even take the test. I thought that was really well presented. And I had to do some self-reflection myself because I'm very strong on internal locus of control. And there have been times in my career when I've bucked authority a little bit, where I was a little bit resistant to authority. So that I'm, so I'm happy to say has changed, but I realized in that presentation that I may have been guilty of that. So uh, I love that. Any strength taken to extremes can become a weakness. So, but the locus of control it has to do with where your motivation is. If you're internally motivated, you tend to be uh, internally, if you have an internal locus of control, I'm sorry, that you tend to be self-motivated and you're not going to feel those awful feelings of victimization and helplessness and hopelessness. You, you may experience them briefly, but then come back and say, you know, I, I know what I did wrong and I could do better. And the results are not the key here and they don't define you as a person. If you fail utterly at something, if everything just fell apart, that doesn't change who you are. And people with an internal locus of control are great problem solvers. We need those. The external locus of control, on the other hand, requires some motivation from the outside. And those of you who are managers and the rest of you can imagine how exhausting it is to continually try to motivate someone. Stephen Covey says, that motivation is a fire from within. And if someone tries to light that fire under you, it's going to go out fairly quickly. So external motivation is, oh, is very tiring and not what you want in your staff. Neither do you want the entitlement mentality. And Several of you mentioned that in the poll as well. You are seeing that. And the fact that you can recognize it is extremely powerful and that you recognize that there are excuses, blaming and complaining going on. That's a powerful first step to be able to see it and identify it. And it took us a while to get to that point where we could see and identify and say, no, we don't want this, this external locus of control. And that brings us to poll question two. Before we go into the interviewing structure recommended by Carol, Carol Quinn, we're going to ask you how you prepare for an interview and you can answer in the chat. Uh, Brandy has a question as the interviewer or interviewee. Oh, that's a great question because I'm seeing from both points of view. So what we're trying to get at now is that the interviewee. So when you prepare, I should have put it that way. How do you prepare to be interviewed? Isn't that right, Devin? Isn't that yes. what we wanted? Mm -hmm. How do you prepare to go into an interview as a candidate? So we're getting some responses um, as a candidate, um, Patrick sharing research the organization, match my experience to what they provide, and then look at their mission statement as well. Erica sharing thoroughly review the application packet. Um, Let's see, research the institution, learn their goals, mission statement, also some top items of notice on their website to be able to ask them a question. Um, learn I can, all I can about the organization and the role, review the application resume, et cetera. Assemble admin question. Okay. As an interviewee, I, Megan sharing, reflecting on my strengths and weaknesses, reflecting on my answers to questions I've asked in interviews before seeing how my skills and experiences align with a job description for which I'm interviewing. 
And we have also um, evaluating how my experience lines up with the posting, practicing potential interview questions, um, practicing interviewing with someone, um, preparing possible answers to relevant questions, generate, generate practice questions based on the job description and research about the organization. So it seems like a lot of folks are saying like just uh, sample questions, working with a friend maybe, um, researching that organization, their mission statement, any new um, updates they've posted on their website. We also have the advice of um, just getting physically ready. So groomed, dressed, um, feeling comfortable physically, uh, preparing an elevator speech about myself. <clears throat> and I always arrive a little early and do power stances in the restroom or my car. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta flex a little. <laughs> Research what others with similar jobs are doing and make a mock portfolio of what I would do in that job. Oh, I really like that idea, Susan. Reading over those job descriptions and thinking about what they're looking for and how I can fit in with that, preparing questions that I have for them in advance that aren't covered in the interview preparing that resume and cover letter according to the organization. Um, oh, Allison makes a good point. Finding out what's required for the interview. Is there a presentation? How long am I going to be on site at the library? Who am I scheduled to meet? Um, also in tandem with that, if the organization's not giving you a ton of details about that part, they're not sending you the schedule well in advance, that also might be a tip off that the organization might not be as organized or as um, put together as you might want them to be. Um, we also have, I also look up possible questions that might be asked in that sort of role example. When I applied to be a library director, I figured out what sort of questions they may ask and most of them ended up being asked for me. I prepared answers ahead of time based on my experiences. Cool. So these are great answers. And in looking at you, I heard, uh, looking at your answers, I'm thinking, oh, these are great. These are professionals. They are pulled together. They are, they are, and maybe you're paraprofessionals as well, but you are organized and you understand the process really well as it exists in, in, in the current, in the present time, in the majority of cases. And these, this type of preparation would prepare you for the kinds of interviewing that we're going to be talking about. I also heard reflecting on my strengths and weaknesses. So that reflection, that would be a really important part to prepare for what you're going to learn next about our interview process. Is it okay to go on? Are we, uh, is anyone else yeah. like to yeah. add? Good, awesome, thank you. So, Here's the thing about behavior-based interviewing, and we moved away from it, and it is the most common type of interviewing. And it's what it sounds like what you all have prepared for uh, in the past and have prepared very well for this type of interviewing. There are some problems we have found with it. And the first is it does not assess your self-motivation. So you may have excellent experience. You may have your answers ready. You may have done your research, which is still very important. We'll talk about that later. But we are trying to get at something and that is much more important to us. That's that self-motivation piece. And the simple reason is you may have all the skills in the world, but if you're not self-motivated, it's going to be difficult for you to apply them you're going to need somebody to motivate you to um, apply them. And I, I think maybe we all at some point have questioned ourselves about what is motivation. I've even heard someone say it's manipulation, which I don't believe at all, but it is a difficult term to describe. But uh, self-motivation on the other hand, because motivation, we know there's internal motivation and external motivation, your salary, the praise or 
um, the kudos you get from your boss, the, the particular nature of the assignment you've been given, whether it's really interesting to you or not, that's all great. But if you don't have that motivation from inside, that's going to make a, for some difficulties, uh, for, at least for us in our organizational culture. We've also found that there are unskilled and underskilled candidates that are highly driven to succeed. And if they're highly driven to succeed, the chances are they're gonna be highly driven to learn. And we're not talking necessarily about professional positions here. We haven't really explored this in terms of professional positions. And if we had to decide whether to uh, go in a different direction from the formal education that goes with that, that would be a difficult decision for us. We'd have to really look at that. But in turn, many of our openings are in some of our lower level positions because they tend to learn and grow in the library and then go off and get their dream job, which we love when that happens. So we're talking a lot about entry level positions, how to give people their first job perhaps, or maybe their second or third because they've been working in the food industry or service industry in some other way. They may not have any library skills at all, but they're eager to work here and we can teach them what they need to know if they're highly motivated, self-motivated. Also, the problem with behavior-based interviewing that Carol Quinn identifies is you often hear that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And that's only true if it's consistent past behavior. I'm sure you all have been asked, tell us about a time that you, you, know, you worked on a wonderful project, something you're really proud of. We all love those questions. They're very easy to respond to. We don't ask those. We ask when you failed at something because we're trying to get at something different from your past successes. We've all hopefully had some past successes but I'm sure we've had failures as well. That's what we want to hear about. So MBI really wants to identify, this process is to identify, how do people think when they're faced with an obstacle? What's going on up here when life or work gets difficult? That's more important to us. What do you feel? How do you act? What do you do when you fail? And if failure is inevitable, so how do you rise above it? How do you work through it? What is going on in your head when that happens? We also want to identify locus of control because it's so tied to self-motivation and optimism and feeling I can succeed. That's what we're looking for to feed into our organizational culture. Passion and career fit, however, is extremely important as well. You may be highly motivated to work in a youth services department for whatever reason, but if you're not super comfortable around children, it's probably not a good fit. So we wanna know what, what are people passionate about and what do they enjoy doing? Cause that makes for a happy and productive employee. Of course, certain skills are essential. They need to be able to work with a computer. They need to be comfortable with technology. They need the soft skills that you see in interviewing, eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice, how they hold themselves, their body language, how they interact with you as a, as a search committee and interview panel. That's very important, for, especially for public service desks. And then we need some core skills. They need to be able to read and write and communicate effectively. It'd be very difficult for them to succeed at a job where there was difficulty with that. And that doesn't always mean oral communication. Uh, there, are, there is room for people who may be hearing impaired or use different communication methods. Whatever those methods are, they need to be effective and that and those core skills, there needs to be some accuracy in things like writing as well. So here we're going to examine the actual structure of the questions. 
And you build these questions based on your needs and based on the character traits you're looking for. The first are the OSE questions, like OSE, can you see? And they, that stands for the obstacle or situation. And there's always one obstacle or situation per question. Actions taken and end result. And she gives an example in the book of how important it is to remember to ask that end result. She interviewed a candidate who was asked about, tell us about a time that you dealt with a difficult uh, customer. And he answered well for the first time uh, to describe the obstacle and the situation. His actions taken were appropriate. I believe if I remember, he bumped it up to management and there they resolved the issue or I, no, I don't know that they, no, they didn't, sorry, they didn't resolve the issue, but he, his actions were appropriate. And she almost forgot to ask about the end result. And that's when he said, I called the cops on that guy because I'm just sick of his complaining all the time. So she said, it's a good thing I asked that last question. The wording is important. Ask about a specific time when you dealt with a difficult customer or where you planned a program or event that did not go as, as you'd hoped. And that event doesn't have to be work related. We often tell them that if you planned your grandparents 50th whenever, uh, anniversary party, that's important planning skill. Or perhaps you planned a vacation Bible school or something else. That, those are good examples. But we want to know when the process did not go smoothly. What actions did you take? And what was the end result? We have questions that uh, deal with, um, are you excited about this work? Will you enjoy it day to day? Will you get up in the morning and look forward to coming in? Does it mesh well with your personal likes and interests? And those aren't always involved with work. They may be hobbies or other kinds of things you enjoy, music. Uh, it could be um, anything that, that will help you do well at this job. We wanna know if you're passionate about service, public service, service to your community, about children or whatever. And we also wanna know about your strengths and weaknesses. So number one is the sweet spot. This is where you wanna hire people. I can, because I have an internal locus of control and I want to, because I'm passionate about this service. Number two, yeah, they have internal locus of control, but they don't like the work. Number three, they may have a lot of passion, but they want to be led the whole time. They want to know what to do. Number four, I, I, it's terrible to say this, but I call that the terrible twos uh, quadrant um, because it's I can't and I don't want to. Um, and also probably you can't make me, but I'm guessing about that. Here's what's so important for fairness. And also, as we go forward, for eliminating the opportunity for bias to enter into your process. Daniel Pink writes a great, wrote a great book called When, and he said, studies have shown people are more optimistic in the morning and more pessimistic in the afternoon. And so if you're going to interview your candidates, pick either morning or afternoon for all your candidates. So you're gonna do all your interviews in the morning when you're most uh, uh, optimistic, or you're gonna do them all in the afternoon when you're jaded and skeptical, that's fine, but don't mix them up because it can be unfair and it can lead to bias. Be sure you relax the candidate's defenses because relaxation yields openness, honesty, a lot of talking, and that's what we want. We wanna learn as much as possible about the workings of their mind. Of course, you're gonna review the application and work history with them. We'll talk a little bit more about that. That needs to be handled carefully or it can work against relaxation. Then you go to the interview question themselves and then the wrap up. So when you ask about their, if you see, for example, a gap in their a work, a work history gap in their application, be casual about it. Oh, by the way, I see, that there's a few years where you don't list employment, uh, it's not the end of the world, you know, don't convey that. They may have been caring for children or an elderly parent. So there may be a very good reason why they didn't include it. And then um, find a way to make 
a, a sincere positive comment about their work history or other aspects of their application, give them a little boost. It's so hard to interview, you all know this. So something about maybe they waited tables in the past. And my comment is always, I've done that. I know how hard it is. If you can keep people happy when they're hungry, you can do any customer service job in the world. So um, that positive comment, when you ask, be consistent, don't paraphrase. That's another area where bias could creep in if you're not consistent in this process. It's okay to clarify a question. We've done that before. If they, uh, and, and we'll repeat a question, especially with those OSE questions, which are three parts. You know what adrenaline does to your short-term memory. You're sitting in the hot seat. You answer that first part and the other two have gone right out of your head. It's perfectly fine if a candidate asks for clarification. Um, one example is um, a time when you've worked with a difficult internal or external customer. Not everyone knows what that is. And we've had to explain that before and that's perfectly fine as well. So when you're scoring your questions and you need an objective scoring scale, make sure that the, the scoring matches the purpose of the question. Don't score a warm up question as if it were an OSE question. You may see passion and career fit in that. I hope you do in the warm up question, but uh, it's not how you score that question necessarily. Passion and career fit may hint at locus of control. And then of course the other questions are important to score absolutely, including the candidate questions. And you all obviously answered, you are well prepared for your questions and they are scored like everything else for us because they show you prepared, they show you curious, sincerely interested um, and able to listen. So perhaps one of your questions reflects one of the earlier questions from the interviewers. And now you have a question about that question that shows you're able to think on your feet even in a stressful situation. It's okay to ask about schedule. We don't like it when our candidates ask about salary. That's a second interview question. We do recognize that it could be a result of an experience in interviewing. We don't lean heavily on that, but it's just good to know that is not a first interview question. And then it's fine for them to ask about timeline. Um, perfectly fine. We, we will happily uh, talk to them about that. And we will respond honestly about what we're doing. In our responses, also extremely important, we need to convey enthusiasm. We need to sell our culture, sell our library, and express our own passion, how we feel about our work. And be honest and optimistic about challenges. It's fine to say we work in an older building, there never seem to be enough outlets. But we can also say, have a wonderful maintenance department and they come and they install outlets for us uh, whenever we ask. And, you know, so it's, it's important to let people know you work in a good environment. So at the wrap up, talk about timeline. If you're still interviewing, tell them how long you expect that to take and when you'll decide, go over the start date again and thank them for interviewing and let them know because they've interviewed, you let them know the answer either way. All right, now we'll go into bias and hiring. So first of all, we found this wonderful website at the University of Washington from their HR department that talks about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the hiring process. Institutional bias is one of the forms it can take. And this was a wake up call for us. Recently, we had been asking people with facial piercings not to wear them at work. We thought it might be off putting to some of our customers. And so we were just concerned about that. And then we realized, oh my goodness, this is exactly what we were doing. That was an institutional bias towards people who look like me, you know, sensible shoes and, and the hair in a bun. 
<laughs> you know, but but we need to quit that. So we told immediately the managers went back to their staff and they said, no, no, you can, it's fine. Wear your piercings. And the outcome was a child approached one of the staff in the children's department, youth services department and said, mama, he has piercings just like yours. And he was so happy and she was happy. It was a very positive result. And Devin and I were talking about this and she pointed out many parents of young children are gonna be in their thirties. Chances are they may have piercing and tattoos. And so it's fine as we don't like tattoos that are violent or partisan or you can, you, you know what I'm saying. So we do ask that some tattoos are covered, but the explicit bias we see, unfortunately, in the world we live in right now, and that's the open preference or attitude or generalization toward a group or others. And unfortunately, there is a lot of freedom around that expression. Um, but the implicit bias is the most dangerous of all because we're not aware of it. And that means it can influence our actions without our knowing. Time for poll question three. I, I lost my note, Devin. I'm sorry. No worries. So the um, whole question here is, has your library provided you with any sort of implicit bias training? All right, so it looks like we have half saying yes and half saying no. Okay, that's great, that's great. So we have been very fortunate in that we have been able to take part in a lot of training around this. The State Library offered training to library directors. I've been part of a fellowship on, on diversity, equity, inclusion. We had a trainer come in for implicit biases uh, for our staff day. So we just feel very fortunate. We've had a lot of training around this. And of course we need to continue to keep this in the forefront. And also it's in our five-year plan that we will work toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. So one of our trainers, the last one, in fact, the, the all of them, but the last one made a very good point. This is not blaming and finger pointing. When you talk about implicit bias, it's not a criticism. It's just a natural part of being human. Uh, the only difficulty is when you don't bring it to the surface and notice and recognize it, it can blur our ability to make equitable decisions. And in the process, eliminate people without even really knowing why. So what steps can be influenced in, by bias in the process? The hiring committee, and we'll talk more about that. That in itself can be an opportunity for bias. Your position description or job posting, the ranking criteria you use to screen applications, uh, the questions themselves and how you score them, and of course your final decision. So for the hiring committee, make sure that committee gets training on implicit biases and then have them agree to work together to work in the hiring process against bias. And the committee itself, if at all possible, should represent the diversity in your community. And I know this can be a challenge if you have a small staff and if you don't yet have a diverse staff, but if at all possible, bring diversity into the committee itself. Make sure that the duties in your posting and your job description reflect what you actually need in that department. And limit the requirements when you're talking about skills and education. Think about what they need on the first day of the job, and then we can teach them the rest. Make sure you have some ability to use equivalencies for education and experience so that if that candidate comes in for a job that requires a two-year degree and they're not quite there yet, 
or they had to stop for whatever reason, but maybe they're applying for youth services and they've worked in a daycare. So we can combine those two and identify the skills they need to come in on day one. Objective scoring is absolutely important in all this process, including how you rank your application. So you know who you want to interview, and it should be based on the competencies you recognize are essential, but also possibly some desirable qualifications like Spanish speaking. That's something we're always looking for. Then audit your process, always audit. Make sure you don't have library experience as one of the criteria for a high ranking application. And we were doing that. Some library experience, some formal education in library, something. And we uh, realized we were screening out diversity by doing that. So the questions themselves need to reflect those core competencies. You give a rating. And then you decide beforehand on the committee, what is a high rating? What do you want to hear? What are you looking for? And of course, we know that's going to be things like uh, personal accountability, self-reflection, self-motivation, and so on. And then make sure you don't score the passion and career fit questions as if they were an OSE question. Make sure you differentiate between what is quality for both kinds. After the interview, take some time to, in quiet to read your notes, and in my case, it would be trying to read my handwriting, but also to score quietly before you start to talk. And when you do, um, uh, the, talk about your difference in ratings. One gave a three, one gave a four. Why did you give a different rating? Talk about what broke the way, you know, your decision either way. And uh, you can change, some, sometimes we change our ratings if we're convinced ours was too low or too high. But honestly, once you average everything together, the math keeps it fair for you. If you have a huge difference, that may be a problem in your ratings, but normally they're very close together. When you start talking about candidates, it's a good idea to be positive first, talk about their strengths, and that keeps you from sort of poisoning the earth for the rest of the process. Find something positive to say to start with. Get an average score, of course, for each candidate, but we do this, we remind ourselves all the time, we are not going to choose the high scoring candidate necessarily. We use ranges, but we also recognize that this process is a set of tools we use and we use the tools, the tools don't use us. Audit for diversity. So if that high range of your scores, say 45 to 50 is your high range, and there's not diversity in there, think about whether there's bias, maybe broaden that top range, that top tier to get that diversity so you can look at that. See if you're just uh, uh, weeding people out based on educational work experience when you don't, when it's not really valid and you don't really have to. Getting the candidate that's best for the job doesn't mean education and experience necessarily, nor does it mean the highest score. It means somebody who's able to demonstrate self-motivation, optimism, and so on. But most importantly, they may bring a different cultural perspective into your organization. That's what we need so desperately in libraries, that different cultural perspective and possibly a unique expertise. So we're at the point now where it's time for your questions and some discussion. We have some questions that came in earlier, but folks, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat as well. I'll read them out in order. <clears throat> and the first question is, what do you do when a candidate answers in general? and they don't have a specific event when you're using those SAE questions? That's a great question. So we, unfortunately, we score them fairly low because we're not hearing what we need to hear. And anyone could come into an interview and talk philosophically about dealing with a difficult customer and what you should do and so on. Probably gonna get at best um, a middle score, but probably, Ours is one to five, so they probably get a two or even a one for that. 
what are your thoughts about providing questions ahead of the interview? We don't do it. We're very careful not to share our interview questions. Uh, sometimes I get uh, requests on the director's list serve to share our questions for a position and we don't do it because our interview process is to identify how people think. And we want to see that thought process while they're with us. Um, our, our county requires us to give them the questions ahead of time. Uh huh. Anybody yeah. else do that? Our county doesn't, but that can be a, an, an equity type issue of what if somebody has an ADA type accommodation where they need to see the questions versus hear them. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that is a thing in some parts of the world that, yes, you, you have to have that opportunity to see the questions in advance. Yeah, I can see I can see both of those situations arising. And I feel very fortunate to be in a county where our administration trust the department heads to manage their own departments. So they don't put rules around sharing your application. And I haven't explored any ramifications around ADA. So I don't know a good answer to that one. But, um, but I think if we had a candidate who said to us, I require accommodation for the interview process, we would do that. We would comply with that. We would need to be asked and we would need a reason why. Pretty sure. Yeah. Is asking for the reason inadvertently created bias or creating a discriminatory situation if I have to tell you why I'm asking specifically? It could. It could very well. It could very well. And there is, there's an overarching uh, idea to this, I think, or I don't know the word for it, but anyway, we seek to create an organizational culture that will give the highest possible quality of customer service to the people who need us in this community. So there, it, there is some, there, there could be some criticism and, and rightly so of looking for character traits for personality traits in our candidates for people who have an, ex, an internal locus of control for example is that discriminatory and probably the answer would be yes it is but i'm really focused on bias against uh race and um and that's our focus is marginalized groups that are underrepresented in the library workforce. Now, that's a good point, though, about getting that application into the hands of the person who needs it. And how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. What else? We also discussed in, in kind of planning the session um, being representative of Wilson County, and that was kind of part of the, the goal, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, one thing that we have as well is, um, is the salary listed in the posting? That was a question that came up. It is. It is listed. Absolutely. As well as the salary range. One thing um, as well is um, in February, we'll be offering um, an accessibility learning series online and we'll have some vocational rehab coaches from the Division for the Blind and the Deaf in North Carolina. Um, they will be working with the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, handicapped to talk about um, job searching for patrons with disabilities, career support, asking for accommodations when you're interviewing for a position. So <clears throat> folks who have more questions about ADA regulation and job searching, um, be on the lookout for that one. And, and I'm going to be one of them, Devin, because I, <laughs> that is a great question. It's really got me thinking, well, what would be the disadvantage? And I, I said, we want to hear people how the way they think while they're in the interview but what would be the disadvantage of letting them have the questions? And maybe there isn't one. 
So I'm really glad to have that question because it's got me thinking I'm going to be in that training, Debbie. Yeah. And they, ah. thanks uh, Patricia for sharing that name change as well. It's um, this year they changed their name um, to accessible books and library services um, to be more reflective of the services that they offer for the state. So folks, we are at time. Um, feel free to reach out to Molly via email if you have more questions. Please, I'll yeah. also include the um, resources that she shared in the follow-up email later today as well. And thank you again. Thank you so much. I thoroughly